from New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We start once again today with Kaylee Lyons for a report on the market. So Kaylee, taking a little money off the table today after that nice run up yesterday? Yeah, it's been a bit of a mixed session, David. We've seen some fluctuations. Basically what this looks like to me is a market that is very seriously weighing the perhaps roll back in the recovery and reopening story as we see virus cases rise. That is putting a bit of a dent into risk appetite, but we're being carried largely by the mega cap tech names. You're seeing that reflected in the fact that the NASDAQ is outperforming to a large degree. It's up by about half of 1%. The S&P 500 was brought higher by some of those big tech names earlier in the session. It is right now down by less than one tenth of 1% where the underperformance is coming in is the Dow Jones industrial average. Those industrial names, of course, more cyclical economically sensitive and then small caps as well as they're domestically focused. The stocks that aren't as sensitive to that economic story are the likes of Apple and Microsoft, high growth names that have very strong balance sheets, a lot of cash on hand, and we're seeing continued investor preference for these stocks. Both Apple and Microsoft hit fresh records today. Interestingly, Amazon did earlier today too. It is now actually lower by about four tenths of 1% on news about the launch of Walmart Plus, which is its rival to compete with Amazon Prime. But longer term, all of these are stocks that have widely outperformed the broader market this year and have contributed the largest chunk on a points basis to the gains we've seen so far. And they're really all that's holding us up in today's session as well, David. Just what we need is one more streaming service. Do you have a sense, Kaylee, of how much of this might be attributed to the strength of the weakness of the dollar? What's the dollar doing? Because there's some perception right now that maybe some countries like in Europe and in Asia are doing a better job than we are on COVID-19. Well, on the dollar today, it really is roughly flat. It has been a pretty interesting proxy for risk appetite. You're not really seeing that reflected today. But to your point about Europe and China and the kind of outperformance we have seen in some of those markets as they're interpreted as perhaps having a superior response to the virus than the U.S. has had, I would note that <laughs> They're really, I mean, China to a certain degree, but not Europe. They don't have big tech. So, and a lot of what has contributed to U.S. equity exceptionalism is the fact that tech names make up more than a quarter of the S&P 500, for example. So if that's where investors are seeking safety, seeking some defense from this virus, they kind of have to be in U.S. big tech names, David. Okay, thank you so much to Kaylee Lines for that report on the markets. As Kaylee suggests, the markets can't get too far away from that COVID-19. And the number of COVID-19 cases across the country are really rising in most places right now. Uh, and it raises questions about uh, how, what's the cause of that rise and also how concerned should we be about it. For some answers to those questions now, we welcome Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He's professor of medicine at Stanford University. So welcome, doctor. It's great to have you with us. Uh, let's start with a basic question that seems to be around today that, okay, maybe the cases are going up and maybe going up at an alarming rate, but the, the deaths are not going up as much. Should that give us some comfort? I mean, I think it should give us some comfort because uh, it, it points to two different things that I think are, are in some sense, I wouldn't say good news, but at least not, not bad news. So first, uh, the cases are going up partly because there was there were these protests, uh, also lockdown fatigue. I think people are people have been moving around more than even even despite lockdown orders. Uh, but that's that's mainly been focused on younger populations, older po populations who are dying from the disease earlier in the epidemic are seem to we seem to be doing a better job protecting them from getting the disease. And as a result, the death rates are coming down because when a younger person gets the disease, they they die at much lower rates than when an older person gets it. Are we improving the treatment as well? I mean, is that helping some to keep more people alive who actually contract the disease? Yeah, I think we've learned a lot in the last few months. Um, I mean, obviously, there's no cure and there's no vaccine, so we still have a long way to go. But I think for people who are being treated in the hospital, we're better at managing them. Uh, we're better at using things like steroid therapy, ventilators. There are these innovative new technolo newer technologies like uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, ECMO, which, which is a way to provide the, uh, oxygen without having to do a ventilation. Uh, expensive, but uh, for severe cases, really, really, really potentially effective. Um, so I think we've learned a lot Dr. about treating patients, and we're doing better at it. Doctor, you mentioned vaccine, and everybody is hoping for that vaccine sooner rather than later. At the same time, we heard from Dr. Fauci yesterday, who was a little cautious about it, said, okay, if and when we get a vaccine, don't count on it being like the measles vaccine, where you take it once, it all goes away. It may be a little more complicated than that. Do you agree with that? Did that come as a surprise to you? No, I think that's. I think that caution is is warranted. Uh, we don't have a coronavirus vaccine for any other of the coronaviruses. Uh, it's a difficult technical challenge, and we're trying to, in very very, re you know, real time, trying to d discover brand new things 
if it works, it's great. I mean, I'll, I'll look at the data and I'll, I'll be, I'll line up to take it. If it doesn't work, I, I mean, we, we don't know, it's a gamble. Uh, why is it that it appears right now that a lot of other countries around the world are doing a lot better job than we are? I mean, people point to China, of course, the first one, but also in Europe. I mean, Italy, places like that had terrible situations with the virus, and yet they seem to have done better than we are. Is that a fair comparison? And if it is, why are we lagging? I mean, I, I think first China and, and Europe went through the epidemic earlier than we did. So they're at a later stage of the epidemic than we are. If we're where they are in a month, then everyone will say we're doing a good job. I mean, I think it's it's a long run question, not a not an intermediate or short run question about how well countries did. Uh, there's also, as far as like uh, Asia, China, it, there's there's questions about uh, sort of whether the same exact virus. But I mean, there was a vi there's literature that suggests there were viral mutations that made the vir virus more uh, uh, more. Uh, uh, you know, sort of had, had higher, not not lethal, higher um, infectiousness that infected Europe and and uh, and the U.S. than than Asia. So, I mean, it, it's it's actually still unclear. The science is out on why some countries did better than others. Uh, so, so, Doctor, one of the things that a lot of Americans are looking f forward at right now, maybe not to, but at, is school, school reopening in the fall, whether it's higher education like Stanford, for example, or public schools. We talked with Deborah, uh, Deborah Burks, the doctor who is the senior advisor to the White House, about what we could do to keep schools safe. This is what she told Bloomberg earlier today. We have to bring in testing into the schools, as well as you described, creating a healthy environment and really working together at the state and local level and the federal level to learn from each other of how we, with putting the child at the center and meeting their needs, were able to create that safe environment for both the families, the teachers, and the children. So a safe environment, that certainly sounds good, doctor. Is that doable as a practical matter? I mean, what will that take for us to have a safe environment for the schools come fall? I think it's doable. I mean, I think uh, other countries have started to reopen their schools, partly on the strength of scientific evidence that suggests that uh, children are much less likely to pass on the virus to uh, adults when they get it, uh, and that, that, of course, that kids are, uh, are, are face much lower risk from the virus. Uh, it is absolutely not just doable, but absolutely vital, because our children's uh, education isn't just our children's education; it's our it's our future. Uh, it's it's their future. I mean, in a sense, we need to develop ways so that they we don't rob them of of uh, something that we owe them, which is a good education. Um, I think, uh, as far as safe safe schools, I think testing um, teachers and kids is a good idea. I think uh, uh, thinking of ways to maintain social distancing is a good idea. Um, Mass will be tough, I think, in in primary schools because you know, I mean, I've had uh, I've had little children and having the, the idea of them not uh, they lose their jackets all the time. Will they lose their their masks when they go to school? I think that'll be that'll be more difficult. But I think uh, we're innovative and creative, and I think uh, uh, throughout the country, I think people will discover new ways of of keeping people safe, keeping kids safe, and the teachers safe as we reopen the schools. Dr. Bhattacharya, has Stanford announced its plans for the fall? We heard, I think, from Harvard and Princeton yesterday, they're going to have severe restrictions on capacity, that, you know, people will come back, but boy, not all at the same time, and they won't be there all the time. Yeah, so Stanford has less restrictive plans than what I understand Harvard is doing. Uh, so Stanford's plans involve having two classes, two out of the four classes on campus every quarter. Um, Many of the classes, probably even the, the majority of them, will be on 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 um, uh, online, on you know through through video conferencing. But there will be some on in in in, uh, in person classes. Especially, I think lab classes will be impossible to run, uh, uh, you know, unless you are actually there in person. Um, so I think uh, there's there's a there's a mix. Uh, as I say, I think we're going to think of innovative ways to, to protect our kids while giving the kids educate the education they deserve. Uh, whether this is a continuing first wave that's coming up again in the United States right now, even as we speak, or whether we're contemplating a second wave perhaps in the fall when the flu season comes around, how are our hospitals set up for this now? Obviously, they were hit really hard last uh, in March and into April. Uh, are we in better position now to deal with a second wave or a continuation, an exacerbation of the first wave? I mean, this is something I've worried a lot about. Uh, I think. The first wave, what happened was uh, many hospitals essentially were shut down. They were empty. 
while uh, waiting for the for the. Uh, I mean, it's not in New York in the, in some places, but most of the country, and that created a lot of financial pressure. So the, the the hope is that we can keep these hospital systems going that face this financial pressure of being empty for extended periods of time, um, so that when the second wave hits, I, I mean, I don't even call it the third wave. We're kind of going through the second wave now. Um, that when the, when that wave hits, the hospital systems are are working and functioning. I think in some ways, though, we 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 are better at. Uh, expanding capacity, we, we've. Um, I, I, I worry about places like Arizona and uh, Houston, and even to some extent LA, um, wh where we're seeing big surges in hospitalization. But I, I'm not seeing evidence as yet uh, of the kind of overwhelming that we saw in Bergamo. We're not seeing uh, expansions in, in in infections that occur at hospitals that are indicative of of, uh, of being of a system being overwhelmed. Um, and uh, I think patients are, for the most part, getting care. I think there are there are hot spots we absolutely need to be aware, wary of and make sure that we provide support to. Okay, doctor, thank you so very much for being with us. That was truly helpful. That's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. He is professor of medicine at Stanford University. And coming up here, we're gonna to talk to the Lieutenant Governor of the state of New York, Kathy Hochul, about what we're doing to try to make sure we don't backslide. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, has tested positive for the coronavirus. President Bolsonaro told CNN Brazil that he's taking hydroxychloroquine and that he's feeling fine. The 65-year-old president, who during his campaign to reopen the economy, called the virus, quote, just a little flu, has repeatedly disobeyed medical recommendations to avoid contamination, mingling in crowds without a face mask and giving people handshakes. Brazil has become a global hotspot for the virus, second only to the United States in cases and deaths. Hong Kong is seeing its biggest number of coronavirus cases in nearly three months, stumping local health officials. There are only nine new cases, but it is a setback for Hong Kong, a city that had largely succeeded in containing the virus for months. The new cases come two weeks after the government's latest easing of social distancing restrictions. The White House wants Congress to pass another stimulus package by the first week in August before lawmakers head home for their annual summer recess. That's according to Vice President Pence's Chief of Staff, Mark Short, who also tells Bloomberg the president wants to keep the cost at $1 trillion or less. Short says the White House views liability protections as, quote, essential for companies to bring workers back and to fully reopen the U.S. economy. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thanks so much, Mark. Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul of New York has been at the center of New York's efforts to turn back the tide of COVID-19 from the beginning. And we welcome her now back to Balance of Power. So welcome, Lieutenant Governor. I must say, you've done it with Governor Cuomo and the rest of the team. It's really, the numbers have come down. They aren't gone altogether, we heard yesterday from Governor Cuomo, but it's certainly holding down. At the same time, it's coming up, not just in the Southwest and the South, but also in New Jersey a bit now. What, what can we do to make sure we don't go back to the bad old days? Well, thank you for having me back on the show again, David. And yes, the bad old days, that was a trip to hell and back. And we never want to revisit that, uh, that road trip again. And the governor has talked about how we scaled the mountain and we have come down to the other side of the mountain. And the last thing we want to do is actually turn that into a mountain range where we have to start heading up again. But to answer your question, what we can do, we have been on a very thoughtful path to slowly reopen the economy based on the health metrics of each of the regions. We didn't do a one-size-fits-all for the state. We have identified the fact that there is a, many parts of New York State that could reopen. In fact, you could have indoor dining and most services provided you know, outside New York City. New York City, as you know, we went to phase three just yesterday, but eliminated indoor dining because it is a risk that we don't want to take. So we're going to continue following the science, the data, the experts, 
and not making decisions based on emotion or politics or whatever you get up in the morning and you want to do and say, well, let's reopen. And uh, you know, we respect that. And that is why New York has been very successful. Plus, we also have the tor- travel quarantine of 19 states now because we have to protect New Yorkers. They have sacrificed too long and hard to have any reversal of our, our position now. And it's risky. It is a very risky situation. We still feel vulnerable and we're going to protect the progress that we've made. Let's talk about that quarantine and some numbers here. As I say, adjoining New Jersey reported, Governor Murphy reported yesterday, they've gone up above one on that classic R not number, which means it's spreading in there. And the, the claim was, at least, that a lot of that's coming because people are coming from outside, from hotspots outside of New Jersey. How can New York effectively enforce that quarantine against all those states where there are hotspots? We hear all sorts of anecdotal stories about people coming from Florida, South Carolina, Arizona. What you have is a situation where many New Yorkers, they have homes in warmer climates. They start making their return from Arizona and Florida, usually in May or June. They may have stayed a little bit longer this year. But even in some rural parts of New York State, I, I, I've been managing the reopening around the Buffalo area particularly, some very small communities that had no cases whatsoever, it turns out that these snowbirds brought it back from Florida. But the, it's a complicated response to try and manage this. We are identifying people flying in from these states at the airports, letting them know the warnings. They're very much aware that their responsibility to quarantine literally for two weeks upon their arrival. And people driving here, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, self-reporting. People understand our rules, but also there are neighbors who are going to be saying, well, I see uh, my neighbor is back from Florida and I'm seeing them in the grocery store. So we asked for our local authorities to be involved, but there's just many different ways that we're going to try and enforce this. But it's really important that people adhere to this. Again, New York was the epicenter. The entire globe was watching how we managed this crisis in the early days of March and April and May. And, you know, it's, it's a place we don't want to go back to. It's, it's too excruciatingly painful to think about what we came through, and we have to do everything in our power to protect that progress. And so other states are a risk to us. And you even think about places like Texas, where the leadership, uh, the lieutenant governor is very cavalier about their response and saying they're going to ignore Dr. Fauci. I mean, really? this is, He's one of the few people we trust and listen to in Washington on this. I mean, where are we going with that? So there's a lot that's going on outside New York. And, you know, we can't just seal it up and protect it, but we'd like to because New Yorkers have been too They've gone too far, they've sacrificed too much, and we're not going backwards. As you say, Kathy, it is both complicated and painful. If that's not enough, let me inject another complicated, painful one, and that is crime. Because as a combination, perhaps, of people being pent up so long and wanting to get outside, also the aftermath of George Floyd and the demonstrations and some of the real concerns about policing. How do we strike the right balance, particularly in New York City? Because there has been a noticeable uptick in crime here. What is the right way to get the balance of effective policing, human policing that it respects people in a time of COVID-19 and some of the real unrest? You're absolutely right. We're sort of experiencing it experiencing a toxic brew right now where you have the uh, fatigue from having to endure the pandemic where people literally lost their jobs or if they're frontline workers, the stress they have of putting on their uniform and running into the heat of battle every day. And when they come home, are they going to infect their family? So the human emotions have been raw through this. It's been so challenging for New Yorkers, fireworks every single night. And then the protests associated with our the legitimate fight for Police reform and the governor has been a champion of this from way before this, but has you know, put position New York State in a leadership role where others are looking to us for what we've accomplished here. And then there's just this inherent tension. You lost your job, there's stress, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of anxiety, and the violence is escalating. The governor has offered to work with the local police department, the NYPD, and bring in the resources of the state police to assist working with district attorneys, and we are lending the full support of New York State to try and get that very volatile situation under control. Again, we just want to get back to normal, but normal is not going to happen while there's still a pandemic, and we're just constantly asking New Yorkers to do more. You know, can you hold on a little bit longer? And well, okay, now you can get your hair cut, but you can't eat in a restaurant. You can't go to the gym yet. They have to continue doing this. They have to keep wearing the mask. They have to keep social distancing to make sure we don't slide backwards. But when you think about what we've asked them to do over these months, uh, it's, it's, it's understandable why there's such incredible tension right now in the city of New York. 
Yeah, nobody said you had an easy job. I think it's fair to say that was Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul of the state of New York. And coming up on this program, we're going to sit down with Wes Moore. He's the head of Robin Hood Foundation, fighting poverty, but also has a powerful new book out on the question of policing and inequality of America. That's coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Our stock of the hour today is Bayer. Just when I thought it had that big problem with Roundup behind it with a $12 billion settlement, the judge put his hand up and said, I'm not sure I like this settlement very much. And here report on how that's hurt their stock is Scarlett Fu. Scarlett? Yeah, that's a pretty ugly stock chart there, David. I still think of uh, Bayer as a pharma company. It invented aspirin after all, but after its purchase of Monsanto in 2018, it's really an agriculture company. It still gets about 12% of its sales from seeds and also 12% from herbicides. And that is haunting Bayer right now because it's trapped in this legal mess tied to claims that Roundup uh, causes cancer. There have been three jury trials held in the last two years and the company lost all three and is appealing those cases. Back to June, where there was that breakthrough, Bayer agreeing to pay almost $11 billion to settle 100,000 lawsuits, the largest settlement in pharma history. This week, the judge who oversaw that litigation expressed doubt about one part of the settlement, which is Bayer's proposal to deal with future claims. It's really unique here because Bayer's going to set up an independent scientific panel to determine whether Roundup causes cancer, rather than leave that decision to independent judges and juries. And if the panel finds there's no link, class members can't move forward with their suits. If the panel says there is a link, then future Roundup users can proceed with their suits. So the judge is saying that this is problematic and he says he's tentatively inclined to reject it, David. If he rejects it, does that make the whole settlement go away? Yeah, that's the big question here. And what we understand right now is that it does not jeopardize that initial uh, settlement of almost $12 billion. So the 100,000 cases is not put into jeopardy, but it really reinforces concern among investors that Bayer just can't get past the mountain of litigation and resolve this once and for all. From an investor point of view, the Monsanto purchase has been terrible. Within the first year of its purchase, Bayer's stock fell by almost half. It had to take drastic action. It cut 12,000 jobs. It had to sell the animal health business, uh, big brands including Coppertone and Dr. Scholl's. And by March, its market cap was less than the $63 billion it spent to buy Monsanto. Oh. So that just gives you a sense of the pain involved there. Okay. Thank you so much to Scarlett Fu. Coming up here on Balance of Power, we get to talk with Wes Moore, the head of the Robin Hood Foundation. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I am David Weston. A black man dies at the hands of a police officer, leading to protests and even looting and some rioting. It happened this spring in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. But it also happened other times as well in our history, sadly. And one of them was five years ago, right about now, in Baltimore. And it's been all told in a compelling new book called uh, five Days, The Fiery Reckoning of an American City. We're wel we welcome now the author of that book. He is Wes Moore. He is the, the CEO of Robin Hood Foundation here in New York, a poverty-finding organization. So, Wes, thank you so much for coming here. Let's start with the most basic. What's your connection to this story, to Freddie Gray, who was killed five years ago in the back of a police van in Baltimore? Well, I'm a, I'm a Baltimore native, and in many ways, Baltimore City helped to raise me. Uh, and I, I, one of the things that really struck me about Freddie's story was, you know, I, I, I unfortunately have been to many funerals before my life, but his funeral was the first funeral that I had ever been to when the person who was laying in the casket, I never knew in life. And that haunted me uh, because Freddie Ray's funeral was a big deal in Baltimore. Uh, but then the thing that really helped to, to, to trigger wanting to write this book and tell this story was, uh, was not just the horror of his death, but in many ways, the horror of his life. And that's what I, what I wanted to uncap, what I wanted to uncover. And you say, I'll just read a bit from the prologue here. You say, we had come from similar places, you and Freddie Gray, but I had been so fortunate, so blessed. And you go on to talk about your mother and your grandparents and the breaks you got along the way. How does it happen that two people with similar sorts of situations can take such divergent paths? 
Well, you know, I, I think that one of the things I wanted to be able to look at is when you look at the life of Freddie Gray, for, for so much of us, particularly for individuals, all of us, who feel like we're coming out from the margins, right? Where, where this wasn't always destined, that we, we could end up being there. There are a lot of factors that play into it, but one of the big factors that plays into it, unfortunately, is luck. It's, it's had getting, getting a break that someone else might not get, an opportunity that someone else might not get. And, and the idea that we would have or can have a society that is relying on luck as a prerequisite in order for people to be able to move from one position to another to another position is really hard. And you think about Freddie's life in particular. Uh, you know, Freddie was born premature, underweight, addicted to heroin. Uh, his mother never made it to high school. She couldn't read or write. She has these twins, Freddie and his twin sister, Frederica. By the time they had gained enough weight to actually leave the hospital, they moved into a housing project in West Baltimore that had endemic levels of lead inside of the home. And so Freddie Gray is now underweight, addicted to heroin, lead poisoned. And by this time in his life, he's two years old. And so it gets back to this larger point of, did Freddie Gray even have a chance? Did he even have a shot? Or was that last interaction that he had where, where he was where he, he died, was killed in police custody for the crime of making eye contact with police, which triggered probable cause? Uh, was that a just one the last system to break in the life of Freddie Gray? Well, see, that's what I find, one of the things I found very powerful in this book is, uh, obviously, what happened with the police was inexcusable. Police officers were indicted, although I don't think they were convicted. But it was inexcusable what happened to him in that police van. But the problem of Freddie Gray started way past that. And when you talk about systems, we talk about systemic racism, systemic inequality. It's a series of systems. There's a lot of systems here that put Freddie Gray in the wrong place. And for that matter, put police in the wrong place at the same time. That's exactly right. I mean, when you look at the life of Freddie Gray, every, every system failed him. Uh, you know, the education system, when, when the, the last day of, of attendance that he had recorded in Baltimore City Public Schools uh, was in 10th grade when he was 19 years old. He had been in special education developmental coursework his entire academic career because of the lead poisoning. The CDC indicates that five microbes of lead in every deciliter of blood is enough to give a person cognitive damage for the rest of their life. Freddie Gray had 36. And so this was a young man who from the earliest ages, from, from, from being a toddler, was going to be cognitively damaged for the rest of his life because of something he had absolutely zero to do with. And that was that the fact that the home that he was living in and the water that he was drinking was making him sick. And so when you're looking at all these various systems that then were in place and just were not in place in the life of Freddie Gray, uh, it, it forces all of us to understand that this is not just going to be about policing. Reforming the police department is, is, is necessary and it is imperative. However, we also have to understand that the amount of systems and the amount of touches that Freddie Gray had in broken systems throughout led to the, to the idea that that last interaction with the broken system, with that one broken system, uh, was just kind of a continuation of a lot of the larger life challenges that he was facing. And I want to take us through some of the concrete steps, because you have concrete steps in your book that should be taken. But before that, this is a story about Freddie Gray, but it's also the story about eight other individuals. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting, compelling way to tell the story, sort of Rashomon, from different people's points of view at the time over those critical five days uh, that were really Baltimore was on fire. Give us a sense of some of those characters that you identify. I tell you, David, it was one of the things that I absolutely loved about the story, because if if Baltimore, Baltimore is one thing, it's full of characters. And I was hearing it from every single strata of our society about what people thought about what happened and, and what were the lessons learned. And, and so I really wanted to then take some of those conversations that I was having personally with people and share them with the world. And so I broke it down to these eight characters, you know, uh, uh, a police major who grew up in West Baltimore who was having conversations with me where he said, he's one of the highest ranking African-Americans uh, on the police force, but who was having conversation with me and he would say, you know, I know that none of my colleagues woke up that morning with homicide in their mind, but I also know for the kids in West Baltimore, why they don't believe me. You know, a, a woman who lost her brother to police violence just 18 months earlier in Baltimore City and who was loving the fact that Baltimore was rising up and Baltimore was, was, was marching and doing something about this, 
but also is feeling a real sense of frustration because she's basically saying to herself, but where was this when my brother was killed by police and no one had anything to say? You know, a, a, a basketball star turned protester, the son of the owner of the Baltimore Orioles, who's the head of baseball operations. So when the Baltimore Orioles played the Chicago White Sox, and for the first time in baseball history, they played a game and the official attendance was zero because the city was in a state of emergency. He was one of the final people to make the call and say, I want to play the game, even if there's no fans in there, because I want the world to see this. And so by looking at it through these various sets of eyes, by looking at it through people who come up and represent different stratas of our society, you know, we really wanted to show a, a kaleidoscope of how complex so many of these situations are, but also how it still fundamentally comes down to two disparate issues. It's race and it's poverty and how those two beasts have a way of coinciding to create pretty disastrous results if we're not dealing with them. So as you say at the end of your book, you know, we kind of know what the problems are. There's been a lot of studies. The question is, what do you do about it? And as we turn to that question, let's first of all talk about the respective roles of philanthropy and the government and basically public policy on the one hand or the other. And you obviously are involved in a philanthropy, a very important poverty fighting organization. Talk to us about the Power Fund. Yeah, so we're really excited about the Power Fund. It's, it's, a, it's a new initiative that Robinhood is launching and it's, it's, it's to fund and to elevate nonprofit leaders of color uh, who share Robinhood's mission and of, of increasing mobility from poverty. And, and this initiative really allows us to address poverty through the lens of this interplay that exists between racial injustice and economic injustice, where there is a complete overlap. Because if you look at the data, around poverty and you look at the data uh, around, around race, you see that race uh, is, a, is a predominant and a leading factor in every single one of our data categories. So everything from life expectancy to health, to, to, to wealth and income, to maternal mortality, the role that race plays is undeniable, but also when you think about philanthropy, over the past two decades, only around 10% of all philanthropic dollars have gone to organizations that are led by people of color. So you see that, and, and also on the absolute basis of the capital, it's even less. And so philanthropy, our, our field, we fund fewer and we fund less when it comes to organizations that are led by people of color. So the Power Fund is really seeking to expand our, our funding to significantly increase leaders of color led organizations by providing self-directed leadership, capacity building, uh, funding, and, and supporting this field that we know is incredibly important if we're ever going to address this issue because the people who are closest to the challenges are oftentimes going to be the ones who are closest to the solutions. Uh, Wes, you mentioned earlier the lead poisoning that really contributed to Freddie Gray's tragic situation. Uh, you talk about in your book lead poisoning in general, but particularly poor and African-American children throughout the country. But you also have some numbers in there that are quite striking about fixing the problem and what it could really do for our society and, let's say it, our eco economy, our GDP. That's exactly right. I mean, when you, when you look at the impact of child poverty uh, in this country right now, the impact of child poverty in this country is over a trillion dollars of economic impact. Every single year, over a trillion dollars of economic impact uh, is, is due to child poverty. And that's both how we're gonna deal with it later on, i.e. through the criminal justice system and educational enhancements and systems that are in place, but it's also in, in the idea of how much it's going to cost and how much lost income we are then having when you then have people who are coming up out of poverty, you know the probability of them staying in poverty is remarkably high because the economic mobility prospects in this country now unlike what it was even just 40 and 50 years ago, is essentially a coin flip. It is now truly 50%. And you think about something like lead poisoning, where, uh, and whether it is lead piping, lead paint, the challenge we have for that is we've known that lead is a neurotoxin in this country for over a century. For over a century, we've known the damages that lead does to, to, to the brain and to the body. Uh, we have just been incredibly class and color conscious in the way that we've decided to deal with it. You know, currently right now in Baltimore City, we have over 60% of, of, of the schools in Baltimore City, the kids cannot drink the water from the water fountains because of lead on something we have known is our neurotoxin. And so it's this type of thing that we as a large society have to have a very clear understanding and a very clear action plan 
about how are we going to address this? We literally could address this. We can make this country essentially lead free within a matter of three to five years if we just put put forth the the economic effort around it, which is not uh, in, in in any way in any way uh, you know uh, monstrous or or or, or disastrous but something that's gonna have a significant impact on the prospects of our children going forward. Yeah, it sure would fit with an infrastructure bill, wouldn't it? Wes, I really appreciate Absolutely. you being with us. And more than that, appreciate for this great new book that you've read. That's Wes Moore. He is the CEO of the Robin Hood Foundation and the, the co-author of the brand new book, Five Days, The Fiery Reckoning of an American City. Great to have you with us, Wes. In the meantime, coming back here, we're going to be talking about politics. It looks like from the polls, President Trump may have an uphill climb. We're joined by Jeannie Zeno, She's our Bloomberg political contributor. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, the polls have been steadily moving away from President Trump, although we still have another four months or so to go to the election. And most recently, Citigroup came out with a survey of 140 top Wall Street fund managers. It really showed a shift, perhaps, on Wall Street, where back in December, 70% said President Trump would be reelected. Now, 62% say it will be President Biden come next January. Welcome now our Bloomberg political contributor, Jeannie Zeno. She's from Iona College where she teaches political science. Welcome back, Jeannie. Great to have you with, uh, with us. Take us uh, through the polls as you see them. Is it as bad for President Trump as it looks? Bearing in mind, we've still got four months to go. We still have four months to go. You know, nationally, we don't look at much of the national polls, but he's about nine to ten points behind Biden nationally. I think the real problem for him remains the battleground states. If you look at the top 14, he's only leading in three. That would be Georgia, Texas, and Florida. And they're only by, and Iowa as well, they're only by two to four points. So he's got a real challenge on his hands. And so he's going to be traveling later this week, we understand, to Florida. He's got to boost those numbers to New Hampshire. We just saw him out at Mount Rushmore and, of course, Oklahoma. But he's got to be very concerned about these battleground states. And the Citigroup poll you mentioned is very stunning because the very people who seven months ago felt pretty confident that the president would win, and, and the numbers uh, historically would have bared that out, now are saying not only can Biden take this thing, but that they may see a Democratic Senate and a House as well. And that would be a really shocking turn of events because the, the Senate was really expected to remain Republican. And, of course, the policy impact on taxes alone for that kind of shift would be enormous. Yeah, and I want to talk about that issue with the down ballots, it's called, particularly with the, with the Senate. Before that, let's talk about that trip that uh, the president apparently is taking down on Friday to Florida. It's interesting. It appears that he's going down to meet with Central Command to talk about drug enforcement in Latin America. What does that tell us about the issues he wants to fight this campaign on? I guess law and order versus a pandemic that I think is consuming a lot of our attention right now, including in some of the states he needs. Absolutely. And of course, Florida is really feeling the impact of the pandemic right now. And yet the president is going to go down, as you mentioned, he's going to go to Southern Command for a briefing. It's right near his golf course in Doral. And I think it does indicate that he does want to shift the focus away from the pandemic, make the case that we are recovering, shift the focus away from there. We understand he wants to talk about drug trafficking, illegal drug trafficking. He also wants to talk a bit about immigration. And that trip to Florida may line up with some exact executive orders we see out of the White House on Friday in terms of immigration. So he really is trying to shift the focus, but it's going to be very tough in this environment. And of course, he is going right down to the hotbed of the pandemic right now, which is Florida and Miami, where we've just, we're, we're hearing that they are going to be instituting all kinds of new rules and closing, you know, bars and other things down there because the numbers have just gotten so high. It's the hotbed of the pandemic. It's also the place that he's decided to move his uh, acceptance speech for the convention into Jacksonville. At the same time, we got a lot of doctors saying you shouldn't come. We have Chuck Grassley, Republican senator, saying he's not going to go. Are they going to be able to go forward in Jacksonville? It's going to be, I can't imagine at this point how they can. I mean, they saw how this turned out in Oklahoma. That was not a good showing for them. They were, you know, forecasting a million. They got, you know, far, far less than that. It was an embarrassment for the campaign and the president. 
the Republicans don't want to repeat that for the convention, and I can't imagine they're able to do this in Florida in just a few weeks for a convention. So very tough to imagine how they do anything like that in person. Maybe they try to do something like they're doing in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, on Saturday this week, where they're going to try to do something at an airport hangar outside where presumably it's a bit safer and people can social distance and wear masks. But I think very tough to imagine how the Republicans pull this off in just a few weeks unless this thing turns around. Gene, you talk about the Senate. I mean, a year ago, I think most people thought there was no chance the Senate might switch Democrat. What are the chances now? The chances look shockingly good. I mean, if four to five months ago we had said that Democrats have a chance of taking this thing, it, it, it so un, was so unlikely. Republicans have 53 seats, Democrats 47, with two independents there who caucus with them. But there's at least eight Republican seats that the Democrats have a chance of flipping, and these are the seats in Colorado and Arizona, North Carolina, Maine in particular. And so if they can flip those and then take, you know, a few more of the others that are perhaps toss-ups, maybe a Georgia, maybe a Kansas or an Iowa, they could be in very good shape there. So it's something that really was unprecedented just a few months ago. And as we look at 2018, of course, a big problem for Republicans and what's scaring them so much is the, pre is the president weighing them down in the suburbs, especially with well-educated folks who seem to be turning away from him and potentially the Republican Party. They can potentially shift some of those states with that kind of playbook, similar to what Democrats were able to do in the House in 2018. And finally, Jeannie, thus far, the former Vice President Joe Biden seems to be making progress just by staying out of the way, frankly, of President Trump, if I could put it that way. But he can't stay out of the way when it comes to a vice presidential pick. Uh, are there risks there? Even as you look at that Citigroup survey, I mean, if Joe Biden was to pick somebody, for example, like Elizabeth Warren, I'm not sure those fund managers would be so happy. Absolutely. And I think this does put a lot more pressure on Joe Biden, because if one of the big things coming out of a potentially Democratic House, Senate and presidency is a fear that they are going to repeal, for instance, President Trump's tax bill that was, you know, so popular among certain sectors, if they are going to pulled some of that back, as Joe Biden has promised, he's going to be, have to be very careful who he picks. And as you mentioned, the more progressive the person, the more dangerous that can be for Democrats in that regard. And that, I think, is partly why you see the president trying to keep talk about the dangers of progressivism in this country and what these, you know, left-wing Democrats mean for the country. He's talked about it a lot in terms of law and order at this point, but I think he would be far better off to talk about it in the context of policy, because that's where the real debate is going to ensue if Democrats take all of Washington next year. Yeah, no question. But I think there's going to be a lot of talk about socialism before we're done here, Jeannie. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's always great to have you with us. That's Jeannie Zani. She's Bloomberg political contributor and a professor of political science over at Iona College. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm David Weston. We have an eventful first week back after July 4 already, including President Trump planning to go down to Florida to talk about drug enforcement in Latin America. A lot going on in the markets, really paying attention to COVID virus. Right now, though, it's time for Bloomberg First Word News. For that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you very much. In Florida, the percentage of COVID-19 tests coming back positive is climbing, undermining Governor Ron DeSantis' claim that the crisis isn't getting worse. The first time positive positivity rate climbed to 15.3% for Monday from 15% on Sunday. It's now at the highest on record, according to data compiled by Bloomberg, which goes back to early April. Florida has had more than 61,000 new cases over the past seven days, the highest ever. The Spanish government is extending some financial measures through September to help families weather the economic fallout from the pandemic. Utility companies cannot cut gas, electricity, or water supply, even if citizens fail to foot their bills until September 30th. Mortgage payments will remain frozen for those who can't afford to pay. A U.N. report published this week says the COVID-19 crisis has exposed, quote, serious weaknesses in Spain's efforts to reduce poverty. Tennessee Senator Lamar Alexander is the second Republican to announce he will skip the 2020 Republican convention. 
86-year-old Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley said Monday he would skip the gathering out of concerns over the coronavirus. The convention is largely gathering in Jacksonville, Florida. Last week, Jacksonville had the fastest growing rate of coronavirus cases of any metropolitan area in the United States. Roger Stone is appealing to President Trump to grant him a pardon or commute his sentence before he begins a 40-month prison term next week. Stone, who was convicted of lying to Congress during the Russia probe, says his age and an underlying health condition made him particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. The U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington has ordered the government to respond by Thursday. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. We're going to continue Balance of Power on radio for a second hour. We've got a very special guest talking about the renaming of the Redskins, something President Trump doesn't like much. He's Simon Moya Smith. He's an Oglala, Lakota Nation and Chicano writer and activist. We're also going to talk with a prominent African-American executive from Silicon Valley about what it's going to take to get diversity in the C-suite in Silicon Valley. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.